for technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> um, did you want to, did you try to join? Uh, Not yet. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm happy to be here today um, to talk about um, statistical power. I'm happy to see some people that are also interested in it, or for myself. Um, it is pretty important for um, research purposes to know about this and to know how to calculate it and what you can do to maximize it. Um, so um, let's go ahead and get started. So my overview today is to talk about the definition of statistical power, what it is, um, why it's important, um, things that affect statistical power, so how you can um, um, play with it to maximize it, what you can do with your research with your data in order to optimize it. I'm um, going to show you some resources for calculating um, power or sample size for a uh, research study and um, highlight with some um, simple examples. Uh, obviously, the examples of calculating statistical power depend on the design of your study, what you're planning to do with your data, that they have to match. Um, so that can go from the very simple to the very complicated, and everywhere in between. Um, so the definition of statistical power, this is kind of all based on hypothesis and testing. Um, and I don't know if any of you were at my talk a few months ago where I was trying to play down the whole hypothesis testing thing and try to put more of an emphasis on um, estimation and confidence. But all this is translatable to estimation as well. Um, so it's basically, the whole foundation is the type 1 and type 2 error. So if you think of um, reality, which is completely unknown, we don't really know what's going on, what the truth is. When we do our experiment, we make a decision like, did we find something? Did we not find something? Um, we have you know, a chance of making a correct decision, a chance of making a false decision, could be a false positive or a false negative. And those false um, decisions are um, denoted, the probability of making those decisions are um, signified by alpha for type one error and beta for type two error, which is a false negative decision. And the power of a statistical test or a study is um, one minus the type two error. So if you have a type two error of 20%, your power would be 80%. So this is how it all hangs together. Um, so why do we need a lot of power? Um, I guess the main the main reason is kind of like what is the point of doing a study if you can't get any useful information out of it? You want to be able to show findings, show you discovered something, then your study has to have enough yield enough information in order to be able to do that. Um, so I like to think Goldilocks where you've got it, it's a balance, you don't want it to be too small, you don't want it to be too large, it should be just right. And how do you get it just right? Um, so some of the caveats of, you know, having a study that's too small, a study that's too large, if you have a small, a very small study that's underpowered, um, it's going to be very prone to what I call vibration effects. So that includes things like um, <coughs> choice of statistical test, you know, whether you do a parametric or a non-parametric test, it could make a very large difference in your data results. Um, so it wouldn't be robust. Um, leaving, uh, cleaning your data for outliers could make a huge difference if you have a very small sample size. So those kind of things can shift your results a long way if you have a small undercard study. Also, um, well, there's a high chance that you won't find anything because you're underpowered. So your probability of um, um, finding a significant result is diminished. Um, the third one is something that probably most people don't actually think about, but there is actually, it is possible for an underpowered study to find a significant, statistically significant result. And most of the times that happen, it's just going to be by chance, and so it will be a spurious result, but it can happen. 
Um, the other thing is that, you know, if you're doing a very small study and you're not generating enough information to be useful, then you're wasting, you know, you're putting people, animals, whatever, at risk for no good cause. Um, if your study is too large, of course, you're doing more than you have to, you're wasting resources, um, you're exposing way more subjects or experimental units or whatever, if they're animals or people, to any potential risks that may be, um, I mean, just, just being in a research study has some potential risk with it. Um, and um, you may also be able to get really tiny p values that don't mean anything because you're able to detect really tiny effect sizes that maybe scientifically or clinically don't actually have any significance or meaning. Um, so just a little bit about um, this, um, you know, low power finding a spurious result. Um, so if your power is low, it means you've got a higher probability of getting a false negative result. Um, but when a low power study actually has a finding, that it is more likely just to be chance or random fluctuation. That's called winner's curse. Um, and um, I did elaborate a lot on this in my last talk, if anyone was there or you can look it up on the website, where we, I talked about that the probability of your statistically significant result being a true finding, a lot of people think that probability is alpha, the type one error, but it's not. It's actually, um, it's actually depends on the probability that there is a true fact in reality before you even think of your study. And so that's why, um, you know, very small experimental studies, the chance of there being a true effect may not be very high because it's all experimental work. You don't really know if there's anything going on. And so when you combine that with low power, it actually increases the chance of just a random fluctuation of data creating a statistically significant result that's not real. Um, so factors that affect statistical power. It's all one big equation. It's all math when it comes down to it. Um, so the power, as I said uh, at the beginning, is 1 minus beta, your type 2 error. And it hangs together with um, alpha, the type 1 error, your sample size, your signal that you're trying to detect in your research study, um, whatever kind of effect that might be, depending on what kind of outcome you have, your study design. And then the noise, which is just the variation that's going on in your data. And all those hang together. Um, so tweaking one changes the others. Um, and changing any of these affects the power. Um, so also affecting um, statistical power, you know, the design of your study. Um, some statistical tests are more powerful than others. Sometimes you can set up your experiment um, with replicates or blocks to like take out some of the variability in your data. Um, whether you're testing for one or two-sided hypothesis um, changes the power. What kind of outcome type you have, um, whether it's continuous or dichotomous, that's going to have an effect on your power. The number of Outcomes. So usually in a research study, you have one main kind of primary outcome, but you may be interested in one or more secondary outcomes. And you want to always think about powering your study for your primary outcome. But if you really want to get the most out of your study, you should be thinking about your secondary outcomes as well. And so you have to adjust for that. And maybe for um, you need to do a power calculation for all of the outcomes you're going to look at, and you would want to go with the largest one, the largest sample size of the largest power, in order to be able to make conclusions about any of your outcomes and your variables of interest in your study. And then the other thing is like missing data or attrition from your study. So usually when we think of planning a sample uh, sample size for a study, you know, you can fix the power, say I want I want high power and find out how, you know, what size sample do I need in order to attain that power. You can say, I know I can only do 
20 units, 20 people, 20 animals, that's all I have the resources for. And then you can figure out what your power is, find out who's worked through the study. We always have to take into account any missing data, particularly in human research, because humans are just fickle and we lose them all the time from studies. <laughs> Um, so usually you would build in some kind of, um, depending on your design or your, your study, build in some kind of attrition rate to your um, size of your study. So how high does your power have to be? Um, what we see in the literature all the time is these cookie cutter levels for alpha and beta, 0.05 for alpha and 0.8 for power or type 2 error 0.2. And these are really should be considered the absolute minimum power and the maximum alpha. If you really want to have a strong um, study with really strong conclusions that you have confidence in, you want to maybe up your power and lower your alpha. Um, but it kind of depends on a lot of things. It depends on your resources. It depends on you know weighing up the cost of you know a type one versus a type two error. And I just want to point out here that in this example, you know, like here the type 2 error is 0.2, 1 minus the power. So we kind of, by, by setting these, we're already saying that, you know, I, I'm considering a type 2 error being four times as bad as a type 1 error. So just think about those kind of things when you're weighing up what to use for your alpha and beta you know, for your power calculation. So there's a, you know, depending on your study, what you're looking at, what your variables are like, what kind of question you want to answer. There are methods out there for doing power calculations, emphasize calculations for basically most things you can think of that you would ever want to do. Um, on the left, uh, we got some pretty simple ones. It gets more complicated on the right. So with the limited time I have today, I'm just going to um, go through some pretty simple examples. But um, just so you know, there's there's software and stuff out there um, for all sorts of um, types of analyses that you may have planned for your study. Um, obviously, the more complicated you get, the more assumptions you have to make about what you're going to expect in your study, what your data is going to look like. Um, so probably more. Um, here we have more inputs to put in in order to calculate power than we do for like a simple case of looking into continuous measurements to see if the means are different or proportions to see if the proportions are different in two or more groups, for example. So the ones in red I'm just going to touch on um, briefly. Um, so in a simple calculation, there are kind of five things in the mix. Um, you know, we have sample size, we have type 1 level, type 2 uh, type two error, our effect size that we expect that we want to, the effect size that we would want to say was statistically significant should we find it in our study, and then the variability in your data. And for example, for if you're looking at continuous outcomes and you want to compare means, that would be like the standard deviation. And so, you got five items here. Usually, you fix four of them, and then you calculate the fifth. So, if you're interested in saying I want a study that has 90% power with my alpha level of 0.025, I know what effect size I'm looking for. I've got some kind of idea of the variability, and I'm going to see in my outcome measure how big a study I need to do. Or my study size is fixed. I can only do this many. I only have access to this many subjects. Or um, experimental units and then figure out what, what power you can achieve with the resources that you have. And so if we hold these things equal um, and calculate power, it's pretty obvious like your power goes up as your number of samples increases. Your power will go up as your effect size increases because you're able to detect a bigger effect than you eat more easily than you are a smaller effect in your data. Um, power increases as alpha increases, and it increases as the variability decreases in your data. So that's how all these things hang together, and it is a, it's kind of a balancing act. So as far as research resources uh, are concerned, they're out there for you to do these kind of calculations. Um, there's a lot of software packages that um, 
that are open source or that we have access to here on campus um, that do pretty much anything you can imagine, like R is open source, um, SAS is available to us on campus, Data is available to us on campus, SPSS is available to us on campus, Jump. Um, and some of these are more extensive than others, like in R and SAS, um, and mostly in data, you can do a whole range of the very extensive, the things that you can actually calculate. Um, some of the other ones are a little more limited, and then there are some online calculators that you can just, um, I have some links to the, some of them are a little quirky, some of them are more, um, a little easier to use. Um, and I wouldn't recommend probably using any of these as a final step if you're designing a study, but they're good for just like getting an initial estimate, back of the envelope kind of calculation, rough mm -hmm. estimate of what kind of ballpark I'm talking about if you're looking to try and estimate a sample size. Um, um, some of them are better than others, some of them are more intuitive than others, and some of them do a little bit more than others, but there's a ton of them out there, and um, they're readily accessible without having to install software or download some on your computer. So, um, so I have some examples. Um, so this is, you know, continuous outcome, so continuous variable. Um, assuming you were going to do a t-test at the end of your study, there's some assumptions to consider there, but um, just looking at power as a function of sample size um, in this graph for different um, effect sizes. So as you can see, like as your, so D is the standardized, um, sorry, the standardized effect size, so it's like the difference in the means divided by the cold standard deviation. Because um, usually you're looking for your effect would be expressed in how how different are my two groups in terms of how much variability there is in my data. So that's like the difference in the means divided by the standard deviation. And so for a smaller effect, you can see we've got, that's the purple one, is like the smallest one I calculated there. We've got the least power for the number of for the sample size, and as you get a bigger effect, we have more power per sample size. Um, varying your, for a fixed sample size, uh, for fixed effect size, sorry, this is the effect of varying your type one error, your alpha level, and as you can see, um, raising alpha raises the power, but we don't want to we don't really want to go there. We want to keep alpha small, so that's part of the balancing act. But as you can see, the difference here between um, 0.05 and 0.025, um, you know, for 80% power, we're like at about 65, and then of 65, whereas for um, an alpha of 0.025, we're probably at 90%. Or, and these are sample size. Like, per group if you have two groups. Um, just a word about the difference between paired samples and independent samples. So paired, a paired design is always more efficient than an independent group's design. Um, and so this is just showing you that for a fixed um, effect size, the difference in efficiency between like a matched design and a, a paired design and a non-paired design. So for example, if you had some kind, if you had a, um, you know, before and after design, because you, re you reduce things over the variability in your data, that's like more efficient and more powerful to test. Um, so just a word about um, measure dichotomization. So if you have a continuous measurement, sometimes the tendency or it's the tendency to dichotomize into you know large and small deficient not deficient and you do lose a lot of information doing that and in doing so you lose a lot of statistical power as well um, and this is just an example of like you know dichotomizing your data set at the median and just say everybody who's high is in one group and everybody who's low is in the other group 
that reduces the power. Like it's like throwing away a third of your data. So think of it that way. You always want to kind of maximize the information you have in your data, um, and dichotomizing definitely you know, reduces that. Um, also, another caveat of doing that is that um, you know data points that were similar can be suddenly find themselves on opposite sides of your cut point. So, you know, two measurements that are close together, they happen to be either sides of where you choose to point to dichotomize, suddenly they're they're different from each other, no longer similar. And then how do you even choose a cut point? You know, do you choose a median? They're not going to be comparable from between your study and the next study that's done because it's sample dependent and you know what I think no no is to like don't just choose Look at all the cut points till you get the one that gives you the most significant result. Um, and also, dichotomization can increase the risk of a false positive as well. So that said, sometimes there are um, you know study designs where you're looking at uh, incidents or percentages, and you have a proportion as an outcome. So you may want to calculate sample size for proportions. So this is. An example showing power versus sample size per group with, so this is for a difference of 10%, an absolute difference of 10% in your proportions, um, starting at different um, base levels. So um, the first one would be, for example, um, so this would be 10% versus 20%. And the red would be 20% versus 30%. The green would be 30% versus 40%, for example. So you can see what an effect um, just the base level in, say, your control group, the, the level of that proportion has on the power. Um, and this is the same for an absolute difference of 20%. So what we find is that if you do have proportions, your sample size, if you fix your power, your sample size that you need to attain that power is going to be largest for if you have one of your proportions around 50%. The closer you get to the extremes, the less sample you need in order to do these kind of tests. Um, if you happen to find yourself in the middle of like, I expect 50% versus 60%, you're gonna find some pretty big sample sizes required in order to get these power for your study. Um, this is just another example of how um, effect size, um, how power, the power sample size relationship changes with the effect size in your study. And this is an example for equal group sizes. And just a note there that when you have equal size groups, it's always the most efficient design. So if you do want to do a study with unequal groups, you're always going to need a little bit bigger study than you would if you had your groups of equal size. Um, so this is just some examples of what some of the software looks like. Um, SPSS, you can do menu driven, which is kind of nice. Um, put in your put in your inputs, and it's you know spits out your power, or your um, put in your power, it'll put out your sample size. Um, Stata is has a whole bunch of options for um, calculating power and sample size for lots of different outcomes, types, and um, and analyses, which is, it's, it's menu driven as well with cool downs, which is really easy to use. Um, so that's, that's kind of nice. Um, SAS has a lot of options as well. Um, I think you could do SAS menu driven. I use it and write the, write the code. So, but it's pretty concise. Um, but, um, so this is just an example of like equal, equal size groups for two proportions, and we're looking for a difference of 20% versus 30%. I fixed the power at 90%, and I'm looking to uh, estimate what my sample size is going to be. And so it'll spit out your um, what you told it here, and then tell you what your sample size is at the bottom. Um, so one thing you have to be a little bit careful of is some of the different softwares or calculators will give you, if it's a two group design you have, some of them will give you sample size per group and some of them will give you total sample size. So you have to be aware, like, is that my, is that my total N or is that 
do I need two times as many as I have? I have two groups. So you have to watch for um, the different outputs from different um, software packages or calculators that'll um, be aware that you're, you're not better off than you think you are if they're putting out, you know, group size rather than total n. Um, and this is just a little um, to show the difference between like this was for a chi square test of um, proportions. Sorry. Um, here, um, sometimes people perform Fisher exact tests when their sample size is small or when they're if they have like a two by two table and their expected counts are low. Um, so just wanted to point out that that's not always the correct thing to do because the Fisher test is actually a constrained test and the Fisher the Fisher exact test actually assumes that your row and column totals of your two by two table are fixed. And that's not always the case. So I think this test is misused sometimes. Um, but if that is the case and you do need to use it, it's less powerful than the um, than chi square test, for example. So you're going to need more, more uh, higher sample for the same power. Um, case control studies, this is just an example in SAS. Usually you would put in your effect size would be the odds ratio that you would be expect, expecting to detect. Um, so this would be like the minimum odds ratio that you would want to say was statistically significant. Um, and then this one, for example, fits out the n per group. So you'd have to double it to get your total um, sample size. And then again, if you had unequal groups, there are statements or um, you know inputs where you can say, I don't have even sample sizes. Maybe you're doing a case control where you want two controls per case. Then, um, as I said before, your your n is going to increase because the the one to one is the most efficient design. But um, you can see it goes up. It goes up um, from 364 here to 411 if you have a two to one. Um, ratio in your group sizes. Um, pair proportions. So if it's a paired design, so your two groups that you're um, comparing are not independent from each other. So it's a before and after, for example, or you know, um, twin study or something. Um, this is an example in SAS of how you would um, input this. Um, and in SAS, it gives you lots of different ways of doing the same thing, and it can be quite confusing. Um, you've got to pay pretty close attention to what, what these are that you're inputting. Um, so here, for example, um, you're only interested in change from before to, af before to after. Um, and in this example, we have 0.3 is the um, discordant proportion difference, and 0.15 is the reference proportion. And what that actually means is that um, this is different ways of inputting the same thing into SAS. And some of them are more um, intuitive than others. Um, but this would mean that like in total, we have 60% of the data that changes from before to after. And for example, maybe if we're doing plus minus and minus plus for the direction of the change, we'd have 15% changed in one direction and 45% changed in the other direction, for example. So you have to kind of be um, really pay attention on to what the inputs actually mean for these software programs. Um, and for example, survival analysis, it gets a little more complicated. Um, for the log rank test, you would have to put in um, either the hazard in each group or the hazard ratio that you would want to detect or the median survival times in each group, um, how long you're accruing subjects into your study, and what the total time or the follow-up time is. Additional to that is like whether the accrual pattern happens uniformly or it may happen unevenly, um, what the, you know, whether the sample sizes are equal, whether you had people drop out early, what your alpha level is, all goes into the um, into the mix. And here you have to be careful that some of the softwares um, will put out, if you fix your power, they'll give you an N. And you have to be careful whether it's the number of subjects total or the number of events. Because it actually, the survival analysis outcome, it's the number of events that's critical. Um, but some 
some softwares will like bump that up to total number of subjects um, or number of events, but you have to pay attention to what it is that comes out. So here, for example, in this SAS example, we have two groups where a Korean patient is over two years. The total time is four years, so two years of accrual and then two years of follow-up for the last ones that were um, recruited. Power is 90%, and here we're assuming these are the um, hazards in each group. So if we take the ratio of those, it's like a 1.2 1, 1 hazard ratio. So 20% difference between the groups um, in their hazard rates, and we get a whopping um, total of 1,406 um, subjects required. So that's kind of just an overview of some examples of calculations you can do. I wanted to just take a minute here to talk about retrospective power and conditional power. All the power that I've talked about up to now is prospective power. So you want to do that before you even start your study. Um, retrospective power, there's been a little bit in the literature about this, and I have heard that some journals have asked people to calculate retrospective power. Um, it's kind of it's nonsense, um, so I'm going to tell you, <laughs> tell you a little bit about it. So what re retrospective power, I call it an obvious answer to an uninteresting question. Because once you've already conducted your study, it's fixed. If you didn't find any uh, you know, significant findings in your study, then it's obvious you didn't have the power to detect them. So calculating the power as an excuse for not having a significant result doesn't really help anybody. Um, it's obvious that if you conduct this study, either you're effect size wasn't what you thought it was going to be, it was different from your um, assumption before you started, or your observed power was low. So calculating that as an excuse for not finding it in your study, it's kind of nonsense. So um, I'll just say don't do it. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, the power is always going to be low for your initial conditions that you anticipated before you started your study. So it's nonsense. In terms of conditional power, this is useful when you have a study that's maybe going on for a certain length of time and you want to do some interim analyses to decide whether to continue the study. For example, maybe there's safety issues, maybe halfway through your study or partway through your study, you've got two treatment groups, one of them is already showing a lot of promise and you don't want to keep going for another two years assigning people to a placebo group, for example, if the treatment is already showing a significant effect. So this can be useful for interim um, times of a longer study where you would look to see, can I stop the study because I've already found what I'm looking for, or should I stop the study now because this is what I've found so far, and if I continue, there's absolutely no chance of me finding a significant result, and so it's kind of futile to keep going. So that is useful, it's calculated in a different way, but there are um, some of the software packages to um, compute conditional power. But this should be anticipated at the beginning of your study too. You should plan your interim analyses before you start your study. Um, so that's pretty much it. In summary, I'm just going to say like conserve your information, keep as much data as you can, don't dichotomize if you don't have to, to minim minimize your variability, think about what you're using as an outcome measure. Can you use something that has, that is less variable? You will get higher power that way. Think about your alpha and beta type 1 and 2 um, errors, how you want those to play out, and perform sensitivity analysis, you know, like you can start with, well, I think I want to do a study with power 85%, alpha level, whatever, effect size this, but varying, sometimes depending on your design, varying those factors slightly can have a large effect on your sample size, for example. So play with the numbers and, and get a feel for how things vary and how much of a shift there is for small changes in some of your design. And be realistic. I know sometimes people have asked me to do sample size calculations, and I'll do them, and then, and then I say, yeah, you need 700 subjects per group. And then you laugh and say, well, that's not going to happen because we only have money for 20 per group. And then you have to go back and say, well, what can I actually say with 20 per group? So it's kind of sometimes an iterative process. And 
we just have to be realistic on you know what we can do. But it is it is a useful exercise to go through and figure out you know if I wanted to show this effect size as statistically significant, what size of study would I need? Um, yeah, that's it. So, do you think any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned that the previous lecture you gave is on some website. Could you give us the link to that? Yeah. Um, and then yeah, whether this will be there as well? It will be, yes. Okay. It will be posted to yes. Yeah. So um, we've had a little bit of technical difficulty. So if we have the audio and the recording, they are posted on the faculty affairs development website. I can email that to you as well. Um, and so the audio, the PowerPoint, if I have those from the, the presenters, are on that. So but all of them yeah. should be. And we're trying to get connected so that we can um, have some of our affiliate locations actually log into the meeting. Um, so that we can have that yeah, feel free to let people know if they're not able to come to these, but they can check in and see if they can see I would like to come back to your last comments mm -hmm. about the size and being realistic. So if you if you have a very small group, can do you think that it's accurate to still analyze this data and use them as a preliminary results to for a grant application, for example, saying Absolutely. that the goal is to increase this? Uh, yeah, because some information is always better than no information, right? <laughs> So, and I think, you know, if it's, like you say, a pilot study, preliminary data, a pre-step to maybe you have some idea for a bigger study, but you just want to get a feel for um, what's going on before you launch into, grant, you know, a larger study or grant application, definitely. Um, and I think, too, um, you know, some studies that get published are underpowered and Sometimes it's swept under the rug. Nobody, you know, people they just don't mention it. But um, there are there are specific instances too where um, you know you don't you just not because of resources, just because of um, circumstances. It's not possible to gather enough subjects to do a study that you want to do because well, maybe a rare disease or something, right? Like you can only get so many cases within a certain amount of time. And so in that case, um, as long as you're doing like a really tight study, I think lots of little studies, as long as they're kind of coordinated, you know, because we have meta-analyses that we can use to combine data from um, smaller studies. And so there is use in circumstances where a smaller underpart study is still worth doing, but not in all cases, for sure. What approach would you use in writing the sample size section of a grant if you have secondary data, and particularly or specifically if that secondary data is very large? Um, by large you mean like 27 million records so if i were to calculate you know alpha and beta right it'd be very high what would your approach be in writing that grant uh, or by, in that section by large records you mean like you have a large n large n large yeah number of L large L sample size okay large sample size. yeah um i mean are you talking about like genetic data or something where you have like millions of yeah yeah um i mean there are special methods out there for um those kind of data sets um usually the emphasis is more on like multiple multiple outcomes because you're looking at so many for example so many different genes or whatever that you have to you know correct or account for the the alpha um Having having a lot of a large sample um, in relation to if you still only have one outcome, then um, you're gonna well you're gonna be overpowered, but 
your data may not be your data at all? Is your sample all independent from each other? Are they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I guess it's a, it's a good problem to have. But, it um, is. Just. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll email you. <laughs> yeah, I'll email that. Yeah. Okay. For sure, yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, I thank you all for coming. I want to um, just put it out there that the research talk is in Career Matters. The topics are kind of um, mixed up and jumbled this semester, and we will also be moving to HSRF 200 because of some of the technical difficulties we've had in this room in particular. Um, so in the future announcements, please just pay attention to that. Um, and hopefully you all had received the announcement about the different research topics coming up. We have a team building for science uh, presentation coming up by Mitchell Sai. Um, we've got a quality review by Dr. Lewis first, um, getting to know the IRB by Dr. Kaminsky. Um, and then Dr. Irvin and Carmen Swim are going to talk about what to do with your, um, when you're unhappy with your hire. Dorothy doing the power stats, I know I had received a few comments from other faculty interested in learning a little bit more. So if any of you have feedback or topics that you would love to get together and talk about or have a 20 minute presentation on and then again talk about the topics, please um, let me know. I'm Erin Montgomery. Um, I'd love to take and hear those, those ideas for these presentations, uh, for these, the series. So take some lemon bars. There's plenty left over. Uh, let's thank Dorothy again. Thank you.